Hey Fit Pros, it's your host Tyler Valencia here. Before we get to this episode, I quickly want to share a free resource we have on the KIPPS website and YouTube channel. If you're struggling with your online workouts or just want to see the items that we recommend, check out our virtual training resources page. You'll find breakdowns on streaming setups, reviews on microphones, and other free videos that can help you build your fitness business today. Did I mention they're free? Go check them out at the link in the description or head over to our website to find them under the blog tab. Welcome to the KIPPS Personal Trainer Application Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I am the president of KIPPS and Time to Train Fitness. We have a guest, an entrepreneur, a fellow entrepreneur on the podcast to talk about his company, Vivo. We have Eric Levitan. Eric, thank you for coming on the podcast and being my guest. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate it. Yes, I love having a fellow entrepreneur on to talk about business, talk about what they've done, what they see, all these types of things. And in essence, I think that a lot of fit pros themselves, they should have an entrepreneur mindset, whether they're in a gym, whether they own their own business. It's almost the same thing. If you're working in a gym, you're running your business inside of a business. So having that mentality of building up your client list, all these types of things. So I'm hoping that we really get some items that people can pull away, apply. That's what we want to see. But let's kick it off first for the listeners. Can you give a brief description on your current business and your background? Sure. So I am the founder and CEO of Vivo. And Vivo is an online but live and interactive small group personal training class for older adults with a real focus on building strength. And that's an important element of this because we all lose muscle mass as we age, every single person on the planet. And it ultimately is what's responsible for robbing us of our quality of life and independence. Not to mention the fact it also contributes tremendously to many of the diseases of aging. Unfortunately, there's so much of an emphasis on cardiovascular health and walking and the number of steps that we take that often the need for strength training is overlooked. And so that was a really you know, significant impetus for why I created this company was we just need to elevate the awareness around the importance of building strength as we age to counteract this loss of muscle mass that we're all experiencing. And so over COVID, over the last year and a half, we've really built out this program and taken it national. We have customers all across the country who are able to join from the comfort of their own homes, but it is a live and interactive experience where they see a trainer, a trainer sees them, no one's muted, everyone has their cameras on, and we keep the classes small enough so that we can give individualized attention, but Mm -hmm. there are other people involved, so we're creating a really socially engaging, community-driven experience, which is an important element of really creating behavioral change, so we do this more. I like it. I like it with your guys' approach now. And an interesting factor that I kind of want to touch on here is prior to 2020, prior to the pandemic, I kind of feel like online training, there was, I don't want to say stigma. I don't like using that word, but do you feel like with your guys' population, the active aging community, do you feel like the pandemic kind of actually helped them get more used to training online and using technology? Yeah, it's a weird thing to think about, right? To think about the benefits of the pandemic, but <laughs> exactly. but absolutely, you know, technology adoption was a huge catalyst to making something like what we are doing possible. And I'll speak very selfishly about my mom who had never been on a Zoom meeting in her entire life pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. And now she can jump on a Zoom meeting like a pro. Love it. And that's not only enabled us to stay connected in a way that we didn't stay connected before, but mm-hmm. it also opens up all these opportunities for really everyone across the world to engage in a way that allows for growth. And it can be emotional, mental, cognitive, or or physical. And so what we're trying to do is really leverage the increase of that technology adoption and Zoom in particular, Mm -hmm. and provide a different modality of delivering fitness to a level of challenge required to get outcomes and finding that it just removes some barriers. Yeah. You know, getting in a car, driving to a gym or a studio, thinking about, um, you know, parking, what you look like, uh, traffic, et cetera, being able to engage effectively from home. It's a really cool thing to be able to provide uh, people with that opportunity. Agree. hundred percent agree with that. I've said on different episodes how 
working out from home is something I've done almost my whole life, whether I was in college, whether I had an apartment that had a small garage, always had some type of at home gym, even though I had a gym membership, it's a convenience thing. It's always been a convenience thing for me. And so I've never really looked at it as a negative thing in that aspect. And I believe over the last year and a half, more people saw that they save time. And I always say that you take that time now, that the drive time, sitting in traffic time, and you apply it somewhere else in your life, whether it's cleaning up your house, spending time with your family, all benefits in my book. And I just think sometimes in the industry, the fitness industry, we hear different uh, motives about training at home and oh, how you need to be in person, but they, they're both work. And yeah. that kind of leads me to my next question. Before we started recording, we briefly chatted about how Vivo was a in-person, that you had an in-person business in 2019, and then 2020 happens, and you start making those changes. An interesting part, though, that you mentioned with the description was about the community. How have you seen that community, the differences, but also how have you seen it build in-person and online, those types of things? Right. So we did start as an in-person small group personal training program at senior living communities, thinking mm -hmm. that you know, uh, you, you brought up a lot of really interesting points over the, the last couple of minutes as, as you were kind of getting into this question. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those things that, that I think is really important to acknowledge is, you know, working out in person, there, there is no substitute, right? Both in terms of how you train someone and in terms of the, the customer and how they receive the feedback and engage. But the reality of fitness for so many of, of us and, and just, you know, the general population worldwide is it's a hard thing to commit to. Mm -hmm. And all of these various elements and anything that gets in the way of that becomes a challenge that makes this behavior less likely to adopt. And, and actually driving somewhere is, is one of those challenges that yeah we've found when you remove that, it makes this that much more accessible. So when we first were, were thinking about this and doing this in senior living communities, that was actually one of the first things that we thought about was, hey, each one of these communities has a fitness room in the lobby or somewhere in the building. And what a fabulous opportunity. We can just, you know, people just have to take an elevator down to the lobby and they can engage in a class like this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, once COVID hit, we had to rethink that, but that was a really fundamental principle behind this, which is how can we remove barriers to help anyone, but in this particular case, an active aging population, mm -hmm. be more inclined to participate? And what we found very quickly was offering this service to allow people to engage from their homes was, was not only accomplishing that, but there was a certain level of um, more accessibility that mm -hmm. they felt that it was beyond having to get in a car and drive somewhere. It was the ability to engage in, in a more comfortable environment. And there's yeah. something really tangible about that that I think is worth uh, thinking about for fit pros when they think about how they engage their customers, which is, look, everybody wants more customers. You want to see your customers more. And we all want to have greater outcomes for, for our customers because that's why we're doing this, right? Mm -hmm. And when you can get consistent behavior and you can remove some of those barriers to achieve that consistent behavior, outcomes are a natural side effect of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The part that I want to just briefly chat about is with the, your barriers to entry, but also for exercise, but also that whole mindset of it, that with customers across the globe now, I think that that's one of the things that some fit pros forget that it's a m minority of people that exercise, minority, it's a much smaller percentage, and that there are so many customers out there. So by doing something at like online training, where you are removing those barriers and hopefully, I like how you said, the comfort of your own home because you're removing that that thing that might be stopping them from going to the gym where they might see other people that are fit that they want to compare themselves to. So you put them in an environment that they feel more comfortable because it's not easy for everybody. Exercise is not easy for the majority. So if you can reach those people, you have the golden ticket in my book. So that's something that I love just briefly touching on because I think sometimes fit pros get caught up in their minds that oh, there's just, there's not enough people or that oh, I, I, too much competition. No, 
that you got to just keep pushing, find different ways to reach this audience. So I love that approach that you just talked about there. Segwaying now into you're the CEO of the company, you are the owner of the company. These are things that I love talking about because I own my own companies and it's fun just to chat about these things. What was one of the leading factors that led you to start your own company? So this is actually the second business that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of from an entrepreneurial perspective. Mm -hmm. And it is a really amazing thing on both the good and the bad when mm -hmm. you run your own business. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there, there's so much about wh what are we all here on this planet to do and, and finding your why and finding the importance of, of, of helping out other human beings and improving lives. And really at the end of the day, for me, I wasn't getting to that level as a part of corporate America and as a part of being a part of someone else's vision. And the more experience I had in business when I was in my 20s, the more I started realizing that what I wanted to do in terms of making my mark in this world was to help other people. And the first company that I did was really leveraging my expertise. It was a technology company. It was a software company in the media and entertainment space where we were selling to big media companies. And I was really, really fortunate to have some level of success with that business where it afforded me the opportunity to do something that was more impactful and more in line for me with where I wanted to go with my career. And it really, as I was kind of winding down my last, my former career in technology, mm -hmm. uh, I, I started really thinking about what is that? What is my why? What, what is that impact in someone else's life that I really want to make? And it was actually my own parents who helped create that clarity for me and watching their loss of quality of life in terms of, you know, and, and losing their independence because they were losing strength and hearing about the interactions that they were having with the healthcare providers that they were dealing with who were really telling them to walk more as the silver bullet for aging. <laughs> and, and look, walking is an important part. It's something that all of us should do every day as much mm -hmm. as humanly possible, but it is by no means the silver bullet for aging. Mm -hmm. And the more I kind of poured myself into the research and really started to understand what happens as we age and, and learning that we all lose muscle mass and it's, it's progressively increasing. You know, it, it, you turn, you get to, it starts in your thirties, which is terrifying to think about. And it really starts to accelerate in your sixties and seventies. And it is so impactful. And why aren't physicians, uh, orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists, um, the entire healthcare community promoting the importance of strength training as, as a really significant mechanism to maintain your, your health and independence. And, you know, of course it's, it's getting more and more, I, I don't need to educate anyone who's a listener on this podcast probably about that. Cause, cause we all know it, mm -hmm. but for the average, you know, consumer or, or healthcare recipient out there, um, they may not know this. And, mm -hmm. and I, when I, the more I learned this and the more I started talking to my own parents about this, who I feel like are pretty educated people, they didn't know they were losing muscle mass as they aged. And they certainly didn't know that you could engage in a strength training program at any point in your life and rebuild muscle mass and regain strength and function. And so the more I learned this, the more I started to see a path for, hey, there's a real opportunity here to start a business. And then, you know, as a, as a fellow entrepreneur, you pretty much have to get infatuated with that idea <laughs> because what it takes to turn, uh, to go from idea to actual business is just an absolute ton of work and drive. And especially when you're doing something that, that isn't really out there very much like mm -hmm. online live and interactive strength training for older adults, mm -hmm. it requires breaking through some walls and, yeah. and going through some struggle. And you have to, if you're not fully committed um, that struggle will, will make you stop. If yep. you're fully committed, that struggle, you just view as another obstacle to go, go over, go around, go through. And, uh, and that's a really important thing that I would want to convey to any entrepreneurs or, or people with entrepreneurial spirit who's listening is if you are not fully committed to this idea, don't bother because you will encounter challenge and yep. you, you absolutely have to push through that challenge to, to reach that next level. 
I agree. I agree. I like that about when there's a challenge from you, from you figuring those things out, because that's literally how I look at them as well, that you see something in front of you and you're like, oh man, this is, this is a hard task. This is a hard thing that I got to figure out, but it's your business. You have to, there's no, there's no, no, there's no, that's right. I have, I, I'm like, I got to stop. That's it. That's, that's, I'm, I'm done with it. No, you got to figure these things out. And oftentimes it, it's, I can't say oftentimes, all the time, it's going outside of your comfort zone. For myself, my background is in exercise science, but yet I can build websites. I can do a lot of fancy things with cameras and editing. And it's one of those things where I, I was put in a position at a point in my fitness career that I was taught these things, but just building more on them. And those helped lead to other things. So with being an entrepreneur, honestly, hearing those last things, I felt like you were inside my head just talking things that I've already thought about and the whole why. I love that because you go through those things when you are working on a new business or trying to continually build your business. You think about your why. Why? Where does that motivation, where is it coming from? How is it keeping you going day in, day out? And it's that process. So hearing the family aspect of it, and it's something that's right in front of you that that you feel passionate about, that's, in my opinion, what helps you get up every day. Get get up every day, start your day, start pushing, start looking for more ways to be creative as an entrepreneur. So I loved hearing all those things. With the next part of it now, with team building, that's one of the things that I enjoy learning more about and just learning from the day-to-day interaction. With being the CEO, I've always felt that you are having to really build trust in the process. And I feel like I've, being a sports fan, I hear it a lot with things that NFL is going on right now, but what the process is, what's the process that's going to help us win games? You hear that in the NFL. I think the same thing can be applied with business. What's the process that gets everybody continually staying on task, continuing on making their content, for yourself, what are those things that you focus on as the CEO with Vivo to get your team motivated and trusting the process? So great question, Tyler. Uh, I love talking to a fellow entrepreneur who who understands uh, all of these really kind of strange, crazy nuances that are really the difference between being a successful entrepreneur and 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 not. Mm-hmm. And from my perspective, when I first started Vivo, it was thinking about not only what are the things that we have to do to enable success, but what are the things that we have to avoid to, to not experience failure? Mm-hmm. And so there were a couple of things that as I sat down and really started to think about this, and I would encourage all of the listeners to do if they're thinking about their own businesses, is what are the things that could happen? And, and literally write them down and document them. Mm-hmm. What are the things that would happen that would derail your business? And so for me, and as I thought about Vivo, there were uh, probably half a dozen that kind of jumped to the top. And without going into all of them, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them just to kind of make the example relevant. Mm-hmm. If we have customers who join our program and leave after a month, that would be an issue because they wouldn't have the opportunity to experience the outcomes and really understand the value for what we're doing. If we have trainers who are constantly, or fitness pros who are constantly leaving the program and creating an inconsistent experience for our customers, then that's probably going to lead to a lack of retention. If we have injuries that are consistently occurring, that is going to lead to uh, an issue with what we're doing. If the comp- if the program itself wasn't fun and engaging, then that would probably lead to a lack of retention and engagement and the company wouldn't work. So as we started capturing all of these different things that we wanted to avoid, what that does is it actually creates plans for how to make sure those things don't happen. And it's an interesting approach that I learned years ago in terms of how to think about new businesses, but it's one that served me really, really well because uh, as I'll pick on one of those is trainer or you know fitness professional turnover and, and how to avoid that. Well, we wanted to get people engaged who really believed in the mission for what we were doing. There's all kinds of fitness pros out there. There's not a good and a bad or a right and a wrong, but we all have our own whys. And the whys that I was looking for in our fit pros 
was people who are passionate about this space, about working with active aging adults who were trying to increase activities of daily living, functional movements, and really allowing for aging in place and independence. And that's not everybody, right? There, there's a lot of, tr- of fitness professionals who don't necessarily gravitate to that, to that space, but those are the people that I knew would get behind and align with the why for what this business was all about. And one of the really you know, amazing things that I'm, I'm so proud of to speak to is every fitness professional that we've engaged with so far over the last year and a half plus since we've been doing this business and it's in its current incarnation, they're still with us. And so it's, it's a really amazing thing that, um, you know, we're finding fitness professionals that want to be a part of this because of the vision and the mission. And so that's an important part. And then of course, the other piece is making sure that we're giving them opportunity, making sure that they're feeling a part of something and are um, as we grow, are, are able to grow with this. And so it's just really diving into really a different approach of thinking about the things that can derail the business and creating plans to make sure that those things happen. And what ends up happening is you create a blueprint for yourself for how to form the organization. I love that. I, I love that. I, I have not heard that before, but it's one of those things that I I, I believe in it right now. I, I'm just listening and I heard it for the first time. I'm ready. I'm <laughs> I'm a believer. And I feel like that's one of those things where when you hear as a fit pro, another company, you hear their mission, you hear their why, and you start to understand, oh, wow, like it, they are together. They have everything together because I can share countless stories through working with different companies about that the motivation was more just fear. That okay, this is your paycheck. You better do what you're told because I'm your manager, and you lo- you don't have any stake in it. You're not motivated to it. But when you hear a clear, concise why, what the process is, why we're doing this, why we do certain tasks, it all starts to come together. And like, okay, yeah, I I have to go on log on Zoom for this time because this is why it leads to the engagement. It leads to the 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 process of the experience on the other side for the individual. We want to make sure that they have an experience that they enjoy, that they see as professional. All that stuff starts to come together. And that process that you outlined of figuring out the thing that could derail the company. I haven't heard that. And that's, that's a great approach right there for somebody out there because it gets you thinking about the, all, all the other items. So how do I fix that? Where do I go to do that? How do I learn about that? And it starts a process. So really cool to hear that. And, from a person on the outside just listening and I can see why there wasn't any turnover you as somebody that's coming on board you could you could start to see these things and be like okay yeah it's clear I need to do XYZ and then the clients are gonna do XYZ and it all falls together because I hear it on a daily basis uh, that they hear about a company that they have no idea that they're just kind of running around trying to figure things out and you don't really believe what they're going to do. Are they going to get their stuff together? So I'm sure your your team, they, they probably feel the same exact way, which is great to hear. With yourself now, with the business, and you kind of hinted at it before, with being an entrepreneur, starting a company, that you have your ups, you have your downs, and you get tested all the time. <laughs> all the time. If you're going to make it, oh my goodness, this why aren't the sales coming in? Or, oh yes, we're having a great day. That's a roller coaster. What were some of those key moments for yourself that you're like, okay, yeah, we have something special here. Let's keep pushing. So there were two, and I love thinking about these and I love talking about these because when you have these moments, they do get imprinted into your, mm-hmm. into your brain. Mm-hmm. So the first uh, moment I wanted to, to share was when the pandemic shut everything down. We were actually scheduled to launch Vivo at two studios here in Atlanta Mm -hmm. uh, because, again, we were an in-person program at the time, and we were supposed to launch on March 30th, 2020. Not the best timing in the world, (laughs) but uh, so uh, shortly after they closed everything down and look, it was nothing um, really, you know, brilliant about moving online. That's where pretty much all the fitness industry was going Mm -hmm. and trying to recognize, could we take what we were doing? Cause we had come up with something, what I felt was pretty innovative in terms of engaging, creating a level of challenge, 
focusing not only on building physical strength, but on cognitive ability and and utilizing something called dual test exercises, Mm -hmm. which was a differentiator and really starting to think about with the population we're delivering this to, is this going to work online? How do we do this? Mm -hmm. And so we just started with friends and family and we started running a couple of classes. My head trainer, Kevin Snodgrass, who was amazing and got a few of his friends and family to just let's see what this feels like to deliver in a small group personal training class online. And he called me after we'd been running these classes for a week and I was out walking my dog and he told me that he had been getting messages from the people he had been delivering classes to about when the next class was going to be. Mm-hmm. Nice. And that, that's a huge, you know, validating moment of people were thinking about this outside of us just delivering to them and they wanted it again. Mm -hmm. So that was the very first moment I knew that, okay, there's something here. So from that point, that was in April of 2020, we started just growing slowly and organically. We wanted to make sure that we understood how to run the program, how to scale this across multiple trainers, how to really deliver high quality product and make sure that there was efficacy behind what we were doing. And we grew slowly and steadily until I actually got, was very fortunate to get connected to uh, a woman named Carrie Hannon, who is a journalist who writes uh, occasionally for the New York Times. And she wrote an article about businesses that were started during the pandemic and she featured Vivo. Wow. And I mean, right, what a what an amazing opportunity. And an article came out in the New York Times where we were the lead company that they talked about in terms of businesses started during the pandemic. Awesome. And what what happened in the in the subsequent weeks, I can really uh, best explain as just market validation is I had individuals who I didn't know or didn't know any of our trainers or anyone involved with this company or this program who would literally call me and say basically something along the lines of, I was having my morning coffee. I read this article in the New York Times about you guys. And I thought to myself, it's about time. (laughs) And when you get that message delivered to you more than once, it's a real validating moment to say, okay, we're onto something. Let's pour a little bit more, you know, fuel on the fire and see how we can really try and grow this. And so that, that moment was a really uh, crystallizing, you know, uh, moment for me. And, and by the way, it didn't hurt that in the next three weeks, we doubled our membership (laughs) because of that, that was, you know, true market validation. I knew that we were onto something profound. I love it. I love it. And I'm sure, those times, even just listening and as for yourself, I'm sure you just get goosebumps talking about them still and and when you share them because it's it's so awesome to hear. And with last year, I've said many times that I love hearing these stories of businesses starting, growing, and just continually building through something that I'm glad you mentioned me that it's hard to say positive things about a a pandemic, but that opportunity for a company to grow and and make an impact. Those are things that I feel like you just love to hear and that you get goosebumps reading about them, hearing about them, and especially in the fitness industry, an industry that, in my opinion, has been behind in the times for a while. And it still is in my book, but, but been behind. And to do something different with an audience that many people young entry-level trainers they look at and how do I even work with somebody in the active aging population? You're doing two things with a popular, you're doing two things, the technology, but also working with the active aging population that most fit pros don't want to touch, even though it's a humongous audience. And it's something that it makes an impact. It makes people's quality of life better. So many positive things in there that a business like yours it's great to see that continuing on that path. So let's get to the podcast takeaways here. And this is a great opportunity that I love to hear. And I'm very excited to hear from your perspective on these things that it's a, what's the guest gone through so far and their advice. So a little backstory for any new listeners out there that this question was kind of developed from this documentary that I've seen. And if you've heard me talk about this, I say it each time that it comes from a documentary of somebody that did 50 Ironman lengths in 50 states in 50 days. Insane. It's called Iron Cowboy. I believe it's on Amazon Prime right now. So if you want to check it out, it's on there for free. If you are a subscriber to Amazon, 
With it, he was asked on Twitter what he believes three myths are about Iron Man competition. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Let me take that, flip it for now the podcast. So Eric, what are three myths about the fitness industry that you've uncovered so far? Well, I'll, I'll, my first one that I'll relay to you is really about the demographic that we're working with. And that is that older adults are not capable of being challenged and having an effective, aggressive workout anything, uh, it, that is the furthest thing from the truth. And it's, it's actually the opposite of the way to think about the population. So one of the things when I was first putting this idea together, I went to a number of existing programs that were focused on seniors and fitness. And I saw the same thing at every single class, which were fitness professionals that were so fearful of, of someone getting injured in their class, that the class was too easy and mm -hmm. didn't really have any results. You know, you go into a group fitness class with, with older adults and 80% of the class would be sitting in chairs using <laughs> pink one pound dumbbells. Mm -hmm. And we all as fitness professionals understand the science behind increasing strength, right? You have to have challenge without challenge. There are no outcomes. And so people are capable than a lot more than you think they are. And it's important to A, embrace that and B, implement that because seeing the rate of change at which an older adult increases their strength is incredible. And then the next level of that is once they start experiencing that, that, that change, seeing the resulting health outcomes and impact on their quality of life is so unbelievably rewarding. So I would just want everyone to understand that this population is so big, it is growing and don't treat people that they like, they can't do the things that you may do with other clients. Now, are there adaptations? Are there modifications? Are there really important things that you need to be aware of in terms of how to regress or progress a particular exercise? Absolutely. And does safety always need to be in mind? You know, of course, but always understand the principles of, of fitness and strength training and that outcomes come from a result of creating a sufficient level of challenge. And so that would be probably the, the first myth. The second myth is you can create a high level of engagement in an online experience. I talk to people all the time and other fitness pros that talk about there's nothing like working out in person together. And I won't disagree with that. It is absolutely the best modality of, of, of really engaging with someone. But doing it in an online live and interactive way can be really, really effective and it can be really fun. The things to be aware of is you have to bring the energy to that Zoom class and understand how to do that. And Zoom is an energy suck. If you don't have music, <laughs> if you're not a verbally engaging person, if you don't have other people who are a part of this with you, there's lots of ways that it does feel super artificial. But I can tell you, I do Vivo with my dad, actually, twice a week uh, and, and twice a week with my mom. And they live in different states. I'm able to um, engage with them in a way that is totally different from a phone call. Um, it's a shared experience and it is fun. And that time flies by. And we really, we talk about this internally a lot. We take the virtual out of virtual training, adopt that mindset for yourself, really understand how to take this thing that quite honestly could be really stale and learn how to not make it stale, learn how to introduce things that move the program along that are constantly changing. Don't do the same exercises every, every class. Um, make sure your programming is fast paced. Make sure you engage the brain make sure you, you create elements of fun and social engagement. And before you know it, you've actually got an experience that kind of feels like you're in person. You, if, when you get really engrossed in an online class, it, it, the, the walls of the, you know, the zoom meeting kind of fall away a little bit. And so I would just encourage your listeners to explore what that looks like. And, and the third myth is really around your ability to successfully change people's lives in, in, a, in a really meaningful way. And this kind of is a, a way of tying it all together. And I'll also tie it back to, to what we're doing with Vivo is the rate of change for older adults when, you, when they're properly engaged and properly challenged is dramatic. In, in four weeks, 
if you were to reassess or, or retest strength and balance, you'll notice significant differences. And at six weeks or eight weeks, the customer will notice these differences without you having to prompt them. And they'll talk about things like sleeping better, um, being able to have sturdier balance or walk up and down stairs without needing to hold onto a handrail, or even at its very simplest, being able to stand up out of a chair with more stability without using their arms. It, it's really, really amazing to see a rate of change. And I think as, as fit pros, we're all kind of pre, you know, we, we all think about in terms of who's the most likely to adopt this program. And we tend to skew younger and we may help people who are really coming at this from, uh, I think, a place of good health, but also a place of some level of vanity of trying to be more attractive, um, trying to lose weight before our wedding, um, you know, uh, things that are important, but um, are, are just easier for us to deal with. As you start to go into an older population and see the level of impact that you can have in someone's life by consistently engaging in a fitness program, and in our case, specifically a strength training program, it is amazing. And not a day goes by that I don't get some personal um, you know, email from a customer who talks about something that they could do that they couldn't do two months before. And I have to tell you, Tyler, it is the most rewarding thing in the world to know the kind of impact that you're having. And so what we are doing is, is really meaningful, meaningfully changing lives. And we're also creating a platform that other fit pros can be a part of. And so I, I do want to make sure that because we have a, you know, a, as of today, we have a national footprint. As of tomorrow, we could have a global footprint. If this is something that you want to be a part of, we are very interested in continuing to grow the impact that we're having. And at the end of the day, it's reliant upon good, smart, talented, knowledgeable fitness pros who want to engage with an older audience and want to be able to have that kind of impact in someone else's life. And I would encourage you to reach out and look at teamvivo.com, which is our website, and look at becoming a part of this team, a part of what we're doing. And you can always also email me at eric at teamvivo.com. That's E-R-I-C at T-E-A-M-V-I-V-O.com. And we're looking for great fitness professionals who want to be a part of something bigger and want to have that kind of impact in the life of an older adult. I love it. I love it. The one that I'm going to briefly touch on is the first one with the community. I think that's one of the things that it was preached a lot at the beginning of the pandemic when a lot of people were going online, people saying, oh, you, you're doing online, you got to build your community, you build your community, but okay, how? And some people put a lot of effort into it and they didn't see any results. And I think it's a part of patience too, building your community, building those things. What are the ways that you're making things engaging for them? And a story that I'm going to share now comes from a YouTuber that I've mentioned before, she's been on the podcast. I think at the moment she has over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube and she has a, a global community that she's cultivated and worked with. But it's one of those things that it, it'll it come, it'll work. You, you do your end and those things will come together with it. And so I love hearing the stuff that you're doing. And uh, so Eric, before we sign off here, you already shared the website. Can you share your social media links? So you can find us on Instagram, at Team Vivo Fitness, and the same actually on Twitter and on Facebook, we're Team Vivo. And I would absolutely encourage everybody to reach out if this is something that speaks to you and you have a passion around and want to be a part of something bigger. We are building something pretty cool that I get really excited about. And I think there's an awful lot of opportunity to continue to expand the kind of impact that we're having. I love it. I love it. Eric, thank you for sharing all this, the why. You can hear the passion. You shared a great approach that I hope people take and they apply with their business right away that it's something that it gives you a blueprint to start working on. So Eric, thank you. Love hearing about all the great stuff you're doing with Vivo. Thank you again for being my guest. I appreciate it, Tyler. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>